Derek, for those that haven't come across you online, introduce yourself and tell our listeners what we're talking about today. My name is Derek Borkowski. I'm a pharmacist and a software engineer, and I'm excited to share my story going from a kid who wanted to be a community pharmacist to in the middle of pharmacy school getting interested in startups and technology, and now after school going from being a community pharmacist to working in my own internet company. Derek, I'm jealous because you know code well. Well enough. Did you study that officially or was that on the side? It was actually during pharmacy school, an internship I was doing at a startup. Once I got interested, I would, the startup I was working at was focused on medication adherence. It was called MyMeds here in Minneapolis. And I basically went and knocked on the door and said, hey, is there, I'm a pharmacy student. I think I'm interested in technology. Is there any way I can help here? And so long story short, they gave me an opportunity to come in and help kind of keep track of like drugs on an Excel sheet that would go into our app. But what they found was... I actually would love like giving suggestions to like the engineers in in the product team. I'd be like, "Hey, can we add this feature? I think it'd be, I think patients would really like this, or I think the clinicians would really like this." And after a while, like the engineers, you know, they would humor me as a little you know a pharmacy student giving these suggestions. But one of my good friends, who's a mentor, he said to me one time, pulled me aside one time and said, "Hey, Derek, you know, we love the energy you bring." you know, you can actually learn some of this programming stuff. And I think it would help you explain to the engineers a little better what, you know, you're trying to communicate to them. And further, you might understand like the difficulty of like, it's easy to change the color of a button, but, and we might be able to get to that, but changing the whole outlook of our app is maybe not something we can get to tomorrow. So I think you'd enjoy that. And so I was like, oh, okay. Um, okay. Where do I start? And, you know, long story short, that's how I got started kind of self-teaching myself programming. And it went from, yeah, a little hobby where I was interested in just understanding some basics to becoming sort of obsessed with it throughout my third and fourth year in pharmacy school and then into my nights and weekends as a practicing pharmacist. If I showed up at a company like that right now, they either think I was a beggar or they think like I was having a heart attack at my age or something like that. I couldn't just show up and <laughs> become a coder. Yeah, certainly uh, it was one of those moments that I look back upon and like the, how grateful I am to the MyMeds team and especially the, the CEO there is a major mentor of mine. He's a, he's another clinician who started his own internet company. And I didn't know, I didn't know what I was getting into or what, you know, it would, it would set me down. So I appreciate it. In our pharmacy, probably, oh, 20 years ago or so, we needed a medical equipment rental software. And I thought, well, there's nothing I found very great online. I said, I'll have a local company build me a rental software. And I, they had a program, I think it was called something like FileMaker Pro. It was FileMaker Pro. That was an old program. And the, the selling point of FileMaker Pro was you can code stuff and then you'll learn how to do it. So I said, okay, I'll spend a couple thousand bucks on this rental program and then I'll know how to do it. So we got this thing done and I was able to change, I think, the red button to gray <laughs> like two <laughs> years later when we needed to. But that's a cool thing, coding. If you learn code... Like you learn code. Is it like learning one language, like learning German, and then you don't know the other languages? Or when you learn it, do all the coding languages then become easier? Yeah, that's a really good question. I would definitely compare it to potentially learning a new language. And so certainly once you learn, so the, the programming language that I'm far and away most fluent in is JavaScript. And however, when I see like Python code, which is another popular language, I don't immediately necessarily know what's going on, but if I look closely at it, you can recognize similar patterns. And just, yeah, like in German, it's like, I'm going to learn how to say hello. So you can tell when somebody's trying to like say hello in a different language, or you're trying to describe an action, especially for pharmacists who get interested in programming. Actually, the first thing immediately after that, that conversation I told you about where I started learning programming, I actually went out and started trying to learn mobile app programming because that's where you know, we had a mobile app and I thought that sounded really fun to make iOS apps. And I immediately ran headfirst into a wall because it's, it takes a little bit of time to you know, get the fundamentals in place. And it's actually kind of a complicated, it's, it's more complicated than say making websites. And it's actually also true of like data analytics, which is something that's really, or informatics, that, that, which is really popular for people to want to try and learn. And so the thing that I got lucky on was I started learning website programming, which in my mind is probably the most the easiest place to get started because there's a really fast feedback loop on learning. You can basically in 10 minutes learn how to make a website because the code you write can immediately be executed on your Google Chrome browser. But if, if you're writing mobile app code 
it's actually not as easy as, like, you'll write it from your computer, and so getting it to run on your phone is a really complicated process, so you can't really see that feedback. Cycle. Right away. Yeah, and then, then that kind of is can deter you. And so it was certainly like, oh, I just said hello on the website. Now let me see if I can turn the color pink. Okay, great, I did that. And so there's this really fast feedback loop with website development. It's the same with data analytics. So a lot of pharmacists want to learn data analytics, and I think it's a really valuable skill, because you see all this cool healthcare data at a big company. And that is really cool. But when you're trying to learn, a lot of times you have to use tutorials or websites where they give you practice data that's really boring. Like, here's some, like, baseball statistics from 1970, which might be interesting to some people. Actually, I'd find that kind of interesting. But it's not, you, you don't get the immediate feedback loop on, like, answering really cool healthcare questions with data. And so that that's where I do think the starting point for someone learning programming especially if you don't really know what you're getting into. I lucked out kind of starting in the area that resonated with me the most. My website for our pharmacy. I made that, but only in the sense that I've got this, you know, website program that you say, okay, I want this button to go there and that button to go there. But as an old fart like me, if I wanted to dabble in programming still, let's say I wanted to give a total of 10 hours to programming, like five, two hour sessions at my desk, you know, just to tap into it. Where would I start? Would it be just like getting on Google? Would I start a real easy coding thing just to kind of get my feet wet? What would you start with right now for like 10 hours just to jump into it? There's two things that are most important here. Number one, there's lots of great resources. But number two, you might have to have some kind of idea of what you're trying to do. Like, am I trying to make a website or am I trying to analyze data? There's this perfect YouTube video I can think of from one of my, there's all kinds of amazing instructors on YouTube. And I could send you a one hour video where it basically says, I'm going to take you from nothing to putting a website on the internet. And they will teach you the basic HTML code you need to do. And they'll show you how to get it on the internet by the end of that hour. And so that in particular, again, if websites was your goal, that would be like the first place I would send somebody because you're going to get this incredible positive feedback loop of having your website on the internet. And now it's like, oh, wow, imagine what I can do. And then you're going to be motivated to like, oh, I want to add a button now. Okay, let me see how to do that. And so in just a little bit of time, certainly you can get your feet wet in programming, especially for people who want to work in technology or pharmacists who want to work in technology. Programming, you don't necessarily have to do programming. A, a dirty little secret of mine even though I'm the CEO of my business, is I actually hate the business stuff, okay? Keeping track of the accounting, the books, the the quote-unquote like MBA knowledge, I, that doesn't resonate with me. And so I'm very much a believer in, you know, double down on your strengths and collaborate for your weaknesses. So for a pharmacist, I, I would say like you mentioned 10 hours of programming. That would be more than enough time to under, to know whether or not you think programming like resonates with you and whether you should proceed or not. Shark Tank comes to town. And I say, Derek, like it or not, you have to go out on the Shark Tank set right now. What business are you talking about? And what are you asking the sharks to help you with, if anything? Here's why I ask it that way. Sometimes I say, I wouldn't go on Shark Tank because if I had the numbers that they demand on Shark Tank... They say, how much have you sold? You know, when you say, oh, this much, they say, oh, way too small for us. If I had the numbers they were asking for, I wouldn't even get the sharks involved. I would bootstrap it up to that amount. But let's say you have to get on Shark Tank. What of your products are you talking about? What are you saying about it? And then what would you ask the sharks for? Yeah, actually, right now, I'm kind of, my business is doing something similar. So we're currently just about to finish up the Y Combinator Accelerator, where in order to get into this program, it was basically a Shark Tank pitch. So we had, I had to do a 10 minute Zoom call where you pitch your company, a 10 minute interview to pitch your company, and then either they take you in the accelerator or not. So let's hear some of that pitch. The main thing that my business is building right now is a product called Pearls. And so I started building this in my nights and weekends around being a, pharmacist at uh, a large community pharmacy chain. And essentially, a need I noticed for myself personally while I was on rotations in community pharmacy was having faster access to counseling points when my preceptor would be like, hey, Derek, go counsel this patient on these new drugs. And I would scramble to use the existing references. And I was like, you know, fishing. Obviously, there's a patient information section. But even among that, I was fishing for the information I needed. So what we're setting out to build now is this product called Pearls, which 
I would best compare it right now to like a, a digital version of the top 400 drug study cards, like the most commonly prescribed drugs. So yeah, we summarize the clinical pearls and the counseling points for different medications. And kind of the unique insight that I'm pitching that we're doing is, you know, the existing references, you know, well, medical information references, you know, it's not a novel idea. I'm sure they were writing on stone tablets, medical information way back in the day, right? But basically the products we have today are sort of like digital versions of encyclopedias. So they're big books with topics, even the drug pages, right? And so you have to kind of go fishing for what you need depending on what you're doing. And so what I would notice, especially at, like at, at, in my role as the big chain, is you would have a patient come ask you a question, and very often I'd be like 80% sure of the answer. So at that point, I had two options. I would either go back to my computer terminal and do the research on existing references or Google to make myself 100% sure of the answer I was going to give the patient. But that might take me a few minutes. The prescriptions are piling up. People are honking their horns in the drive through there's angry customer stares. The manager is trying to, you know, get mad about our metrics. So oftentimes what pharmacists and doctors and nurses are forced to do is give the patient an answer you're 100% sure of, but it only kind of partially answers their question. So what with Pearls, what we're trying to do is we're building a new medical information reference that supports specific workflows you're doing. Like, I'm about to counsel a patient, so you click that button in Pearls. Or I'm about to do clinical review. You know, I just got a new prescription and I'm deciding if I should approve it or not. That's clinical review. So here's the, we, we show you, here's the clinical review points. Or if you're a doctor and I'm about to prescribe a drug, what are the clinical review points I need to have top of mind in order to, you know, do this workflow? So that's my pitch to Shark Tank. And then oh, how big is the market? Well, I just described that, you know, right now there's, um, you know, there's over 300,000 pharmacists. There's over a million doctors. There's basically 8 million clinicians total in the United States that are all having hundreds of dollars per user per year paid on them either through themselves or through, or the health system is, you know, paying for access on a group level. And so I say, well, there's an existing, there's already money being spent on, on these types of tools and we can do it even better than those. Do you dislike any of the sharks? Do you know the sharks by name? Um, only the, uh, you know, Mark, Mark Cuban and, and, um, and Mr. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah exactly. I was, uh, I was picturing, you know, his, um, <laughs> his demeanor there, but yes, Mr. Wonderful. Couple of the gals. Mm -hmm. Are there any of them that, rub you the wrong way? No, I like how they have a, you know, variety of opinions. Because that's actually the thing, especially about early, in early stage businesses, everyone has a different thesis. And so I, I think that's maybe one of the nice things about the show is you hear, even though it's a little bit, you know, uh, hyperbolized, I think, and made for TV, you do get to see the real life fact that investors have a wide variety of opinions and they don't, and, and it's very much an art. <laughs> You're going to get three questions from the sharks, and they're going to make you sweat a little bit. What are the three questions? What are the most difficult three questions you can imagine them asking you? And then what would your response be? Well, for me personally, one of the things I run into nowadays, because the, the type of investors I do talk to are you know, Silicon Valley venture capitalists or, or, or tech generalists. And so I have to start by explaining what the heck we, you know, my product even is. Oh, it's a new medical information reference. That's kind of boring. That's not very sexy. That, that's not, um, for example, there, there's companies in my current Y Combinator batch that are mining asteroids or, you know, doing, you know, you can imagine any wild dream. So for me, one of the challenges is relaying the importance to clinicians that having, you know, practice information right at your fingertips, how important that is. What's number two? They'll say, well, what, why doesn't one of these existing competitors, like, why couldn't they just do what you're doing? And so, you know, I'll explain that both pearls and other references that exist, we all get our information from the same places. That is true. You know, the, the FDA publishes, is, is the foundational source for drug information. Then there's clinical practice guidelines. Then there's primary literature. You know, these are where, this is where we get the information that we, you know, use in practice. And so what I explain to them is actually it's not as simple as existing references moving their content around on the page. You know, we are starting from, we actually worked backwards from the interface of our product and then built our database schema to support that. So actually competitors would have to basically start from scratch and do all the work that we have in order to replicate our product. And they have no incentive to do so right now. And the last question I would say, you know, it's, it's actually, it's something I, uh, you know, I, I, I appreciate and, and uh, you're a first time founder. What the heck do you know about this? How are you going to make sales to a health system? You know, uh, 
And actually, you know, my answer to that is oftentimes you'll hear that being naive is often exactly what you needed to know that, you know, if, if you know too much, then you actually think you can't do something where my, you know, naivete of first time founders often is what leads them to try things that others wouldn't uh, venture out and do. How does that work then? The pharmacist has this in their pocket. They pull out pearls. It's an app. They're bopping around on it, and then they get the best counseling points. Yeah, yep. So we have both a website and a mobile app, but I would say that, yeah, the, the mobile app is probably what's used 60-40 more than the website. Um, and so, yeah, by far the most common use case that current um, customers of Pearls will use is looking up the... You can see in you know the usage logs, they're looking for a drug and then clicking on the counseling points. So that's by far what we know is the most most uh, value add feature. The next thing is that we also have a lot of like nice comparison charts or summaries of pharmacotherapy. For example, with diabetes, we have nice summaries on when is this drug supposed to be used versus when is this drug supposed to be used. So that I would say is the other sort of differentiated type of content that people are coming to Pearls for. Where do people bail off your site and has that caused you to change things? Yeah, well, I would certainly say having like an early stage internet startup like mine, you always feel like you're kind of like, like, like your business is a pail and the customers are like pouring water into it and you have a bunch of holes where, where you're losing things, you know, like, yeah, like definitely I just think back to like the first whatever, several months that Pearls was out there. And I'm like, oh, there was so many missed opportunities to ask customers. Why didn't you come back? Even now there's, there's, um, you know, places that we lose that we would have no way of detecting, um, or knowing. And so, yeah, actually this, this comes back to a really important principle, which is there's this thing in startups, I guess actually any business where as soon as somebody signs up for your product, you want to ram them head first as fast as you can into an aha moment. So basically, as soon as they sign up, you want them to perceive and get some sort of value. So for us, what that is, is like I mentioned, one thing people, besides counseling points, people really like our charts. And so as soon as you come into the platform, and actually a lot of our marketing goes, um, is, is focused around just sign up for pearls and get, get, get these. We have the best inhalers chart. If you are, if you're trying to impair, you know, in your community pharmacy, if you're trying to compare what, you know, your C quickly reference, oh, what inhaler is that one again? We have the best inhalers chart in the country. And so we, we try and put that in your hands as soon as you sign up for the product so that even if you don't go and explore or, or go through our complete um, tutorial, um, you know, you'll have some sort of aha. And that actually brings you back to another thing, which is there's also this interesting challenge when you're a new company where you don't want to introduce too much friction into the process. So, you know, our sign up page, even still now, all you have to do like right on the homepage of Pearls, it asks for your email and it says, get started. And then that brings you to where you can put your password in and get started. Where a lot of you know websites will gather your name, your position, your address, and then someone falls out. So there's, but then you know less about that user. So maybe the person who signed up and left is somebody who never would have paid, but you don't know anything about them. And so there's always this fine balance, especially in the early stages, and especially when you're selling to consumers like we do versus businesses, where we have to keep the friction minimal, but also try and make the ahas happen as early and often as possible. You also have that kind of a dilemma, I imagine, on settings, right? Because you want enough settings to make it feel like it's theirs, but you also don't want a page of a bunch of parameters they have to set. Like I think of LinkedIn, it's a decent system, but you go into their notifications, you know, and they ask you, are you looking at online or email or push? And then there's probably... <laughs> 60 settings for each of them. It's just too many, but you have to deal with that, I'm sure. Yeah, definitely. And that's something that we've so far kept to a minimal. And actually, one thing I will mention that I like about LinkedIn's interface that I think we should probably incorporate into ours is they have, it feels like everywhere they have that like progress bar, you know, like on your profile says like you're a rookie versus intermediate versus all-star. And I feel like that's something we should probably put on Pearl is like, okay, now you've checked out the charts, but you still haven't checked out these things. And so it's, you know, kind of like a low friction way of saying like, of, 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 of like gamifying the experience of having to give yourself a tour without forcing someone to go through a tutorial where they're annoyed and like, all right, I'm leaving. <laughs> I hate those though, Derek, because whenever I'm on a pharmacy program, to me, they always say, Mike, you should consider going to pharmacy school. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mike, how would you like this pharmacy intern job at the hospital? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How many people are focused on Pearl? Well, I'll give you a quick backstory on that. So, 
Yeah, Pearls. So I went, I left my, my daytime, my, my full-time pharmacist jobs in January of 2020. And I started bootstrapping this by myself. And at the time it was just myself. And then I had a handful of contract pharmacist advisors who were clinical experts in different areas that I would, you know, that all the content would get reviewed through before we push it live. And so since then, um, actually just over the course of the last, you know, year, I also had some interns join my team, some pharmacy student interns who would help with information collection. And then over the last few months, my first full-time hire actually started. He's another pharmacist programmer like myself. And then just in the last few weeks, another pharmacist um, designer actually joined our team to help with the, the build out more user experiences and graphic design tools. And the last person I would that, that's, that's on our team um, is a he's actually a physician assistant who I met through an entrepreneurial program who's helping manage our social media and, and help build our roadmap where for building features for those in medicine. So there's one common theme of everybody involved. It's the clinical background, which I think is what the differentiator of our company is, is that we have, you know, everyone is also the end user of our product. Some of the things that kept me going like in the first year was like, well, if nobody wants this, I want this. <laughs> you know, I, I'm trying to build this, for, you know, because I would still moonlight um, until just this last summer. And so I'd, you know, I would field test my product. I'd write down on no, scraps, scraps of paper what drugs I should add that night or what features needed to be added to make this better. And so that was, um, that, that was and continues to be, I think, one of the things that's unique about the team that's collaborating on this. When I hear bootstrapping, I think of maybe not a ton of debt. You're kind of growing from zero and, and kind of going as you go. Was there any step in the process where you had to jump off the cliff and take a lot of yeah. financial risk besides leaving your job? Mm -hmm. Or were you able to grow on a steady incline? When I first got interested in startups and technology, I actually did learn about you know this Y Combinator accelerator I'm doing now, which is they are a venture capital firm who makes an investment in your company. And I thought that applying to their program was the only way that you could start an internet business. Like if, if they didn't accept you, then you didn't have a good idea. Um, and so anyway, the first time I applied to them, I got an interview and they only interview like a single digit percent of people that apply and they get, they get, they get five digit, ten, tens of thousands of applications a batch. And so I was like, wow, this, uh, they must, this must be a good idea. Long story short, I flew out to Silicon Valley where they, they, they fly you in for your, for your 10 minute interview. I had a, lightning fast 10 minute interview and was immediately shown the door and got my rejection uh, email later that night. Really? But this was around my full-time jobs. And so at that point though, I was like, I don't care. I'm, I'm going to go after this. So this was about October of 2019. And so by January, I had left my full-time jobs. I had some money in the bank um, and said, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to go all in on this. And so let me just preface the next part of this by saying, I come from a middle-class family with healthy parents. I'm an only child. I have a wife who's also a pharmacist. So I, I would not describe myself as, even if I would have lost every single, all of my money and, and got deeply into debt, I'm still in, in a pretty safe scenario compared to some people, right? Like you, you could imagine people with much more risk than I took. Sure. But that being said, yeah, I, January 2020, I had some money in my bank. And over the course of 2020, I basically rode that to zero. <laughs> um, but I was, um, I can't remember if we were engaged at the time. I was with my, my, my now wife and we made a deal that basically, I, so, and also oh, I forgot the, the biggest part of why this wasn't that risky for me was I was still employed in the float pool at, as a pharmacist. So I could still pick up pharmacist shifts if, if they were available. So what we did was either between money I made from Pearl's or working Walgreens shifts, I had to find, or, or spending my, the money I had saved up, I had to find a way to pay half of everything. So half of our rent, half of our food, half of our expenses. And if I couldn't do that, then I needed to go get a job again. And so that plan actually worked out really well because it, it put, it sort of put like rules to the game that, that, that kind of prevented the risk. Like we had a plan. Okay, if I can't pay half of everything, well, then I need to stop. Towards the end of 2020 is when the business started to sort of pull its own weight and things started to go the opposite direction where I could start to work less shifts, less money, no money was coming out of savings. Um, you know, and I could start to put money back into savings. And then, yeah, just this last summer, so um, July of 2020 was when I took my first like venture capital investment. Um, and so it kind of switched from bootstrapping to now operating the business, you know, with that in mind. I understand the whole thing about how these multi hundreds of billionaires, you know, I understand they only own a 
a part of the company, let's say, you know, Bezos owns a part of Amazon, a small part, basically, and there are hundreds of billions of dollars. I get that, but I come from the scarce world of pharmacy where I'm like, I don't want anybody to own any of my stuff because it's such a scarcity of profit that I don't want to give any of it away. But obviously to bring venture capital in, either you've got to feel like you're on your last leg or you have to have that dream of saying this is going to be so big and the VC is going to make it big that I'm willing to give away some of the profit or their percentage. What's your mindset going into saying that you need venture capital? If you take any investment, it's either because it lets you move faster or do something you couldn't do otherwise. And so I would say in the case of my business, it really helped us move faster. Pearls, it probably takes about eight hours per drug page, um, <laughs> you know, to make them. And then at the expense, like to make each like additional drug that goes into Pearls. And the price that we can charge for Pearls is directly correlated with how big our drug library is. So, you know, we char when Pearls was first launched, we only had about a hundred medications in it. And now we have, you know, I'm at, like I said, in that 400 range. And so we charge more accordingly, you know, and so I could have definitely kept, you know, putting one drug in, you know, at a time and then doing the marketing of that. But what I was really excited about to partner with, you know, with venture and take venture capital investment was so that we could, you know, move faster. And actually, one of the one of my issues now is, or like, you know, they joke about this in, in Y Combinator a little bit. Or I have is, you know, I, I I am a bootstrap. I was born a bootstrapper, and so I I still have bootstrapper mentality. Which when you're venture backed, if you're making a profit, that's not a good thing. But hold on, hold on, it's because you should be investing that profit immediately into something to grow. If you've got profit sitting around, you're not growing quickly enough. Exactly. So as soon as we have, you know, which by the time we took venture capital, we were, you know, it was paying my, you know, my money or it was paying me and it was paying, you know, the things that we needed to pay. And so, and so, yeah, at the point now it's any extra money we have, we need to be putting that back into more marketing or hiring another person to help make more, more content so that we can charge more for our products so that we can make more money so that we can put it back into more marketing so that we can charge more. <laughs> yeah. We come from the mindset of wanting to hold on to the money, but they want to keep investing it. Jeff Bezos has this regret minimization framework, which is if you're trying to make a decision today and you can't decide, just picture yourself on your deathbed and say, what would that person have wanted to do? And so for me, even if I jump, my, bring myself to age 40, my regret minimization framework says there's no better time for me to try and start and grow a, a business as big as it can be to try and, you know, bring, you know, a, a new impact to the world. And, and, and basically the only, so the pulse check I just need to constantly have for myself is, am I still enjoying this? Because that's actually with, with especially with venture backed businesses, one of the biggest reasons that venture backed businesses fail is because the founders burn out. Um, because it is a different type of pace. Um, that's again, the, the, what's, if you're, if you're working with good investors like I am, they don't force you to make unhealthy growth. Um, and they, they remind you, this is actually another Y Combinator saying is be a cockroach, which means the number, the number one, the number one rule of startups is don't die. And so, yeah, it is certainly, you know, a goal as long as possible to make sure I am still in control of all the decisions, even if there are other people on my cap table. If you're going to go with the mindset that you want to make a big business, you know, ha having a small slice of a big pie is, 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 is more than having the whole, the whole small pie. And so, and, and you know, so again, I'm just at the stage in my life where, I'm really enjoying what I'm working on. I'm enjoying the chance to work with a wide variety of people. And, and, and I, I really do just sort of feel like, you know, each day that I'm on, that I'm, that I'm riding the most fun roller coaster um, I, could, I could be riding. One of my guests had said when I talked about not wanting a um, partner because our family business is only one person from each generation. My grandpa and dad are passed. And so I'm the benevolent dictator of this generation. But... <laughs> There's no way I'd like any of my siblings involved with this. It just wouldn't work out. So I always bemoan the idea of having a partner. But this one guest I had was saying that he never would have wanted to build a business alone because with the hours and the, I guess many of the hours, maybe the stress, it's just too lonely. It's great to have that camaraderie. In this, do you consider yourself lonely? Do you consider the people that you're working with now as mental camaraderies? I, you know, I do definitely probably consider myself more like, you know, an introvert, um, like a lot of people do. But one thing that I'll hear my wife comment on not too often is, oh, you're such an only child. Um, <laughs> and so I, I do certainly think that, 
you know, growing up an only child, you know, I, you can lock me in a room and I will entertain myself with a speck of dust on the ground. I don't, I don't mind it. Um, but I just, again, I'm always just re amazed by when you do work with people, how there's always just new ideas that you never would have thought of yourself. And, and that is, and that is really, that is, you, that is always interesting. I remember when I first graduated, I went down to a leadership training school with NCPA and a thought that sticks with me is that they said, all right, we're going to drop you into Alaska, you know, figure we're going to drop you into Alaska and see if you can find your way out. So then we all figured this out on our own. And then they, I think they put us together as a group and then they said, all right, you now you have an hour to be with these six people and think about how you're going to get out. And then, you know, we all put these ideas together. And I remember that somehow they went around and they judged like individual ideas versus a group ideas. And every time the group idea just worked out better. You know, even if you used 80% from one person, you're still picking up a 20% better idea from someone else in the group. Yeah. I think it's a law of the universe, right? Like it's just, it's incredible how it happens that way. And, and so that's certainly where, yeah, even though I, I, w- I don't know that I necessarily get lonely and I think it's really important that I haven't gotten lonely over the last two years of doing this. Um, it's such a, it's such a ad and such a beautiful thing. Um, that I feel so grateful to work with the people I do. I always say if I was an attorney, I'd probably bill for, you know, 120 hours a week because the business is always on your mind. Are these long days for you? Yeah. I, I don't. <laughs> for, for our listeners, Derek just started crying. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's, I'm blessed with I maybe too many riches in my life, but meaning like hanging out with my wonderful friends and family. But like this past weekend, actually, my, my wife was out of town and it was just me and the dog. And so I sat here and coded all weekend. And it was, there was nothing, like there was nothing more fun than working, than working on pearls. And um, it's still that way. So yeah, I, I, uh, it's on my mind <laughs> all day. <laughs> In this crazy world with this new war going on and cancel culture, or, you know, social media, all that stuff, there's a certain peacefulness about focusing on one thing this hobby of my podcast you know in this crazy world it's fun sometimes just to focus it seems to pull your mind in from going crazy in this world you know it's just a way to like to say okay for some reason the stars have lined up to say that this is where i belong right now and i'm comfortable with it um no definitely i obviously there's never been another time to live where so many things are competing for our attention and and so I certainly also feel the naturalness that like focus actually I think you know <laughs> brings back to um, the, you know the lived experience. Do you wake up any days and say ah crap I got to do that this day of the month or this is coming up you know two days from now what is that? Certainly my meetings with my accountant um, even though I'm even though before the accountant was it was worse because then I have to deal with that stuff myself. So still as the founder, I'm still, you know, one of the three full-time team members here. And so a lot of the work that needs to be done, which is writing code and doing um, content creation, these things require like day, like days of a clean open schedule. And, and so it's funny, as much as I do love like having meetings, it's it, it can be frustrating when I can't create like 72 hours for myself to get back to, you know, writing code or, or, or doing content. Um, and then otherwise, yeah, I, I certainly think that um, I am somebody who unfortunately requires seven, eight hours of sleep. Like I know when I get six hours or four or five hours of sleep a few days in a row, I start having the demons start saying, nobody's going to want pearls. Um, you know, this, this isn't, this isn't going to work. And then, and so I just be like, well, okay, that means I need to go to bed. When you say code, give me an idea. Like if I asked this question to me when I was, let's say, designing my website, here's what I would say. Okay. I go on this page and ask me, how big of a font do I want? And I do this and I have a box that says, do you want the box in the left or the center or the right? Okay. So that's like a thought I had with just setting up this simple website. Give me your trickiest thing. Are you like thinking, okay, comma, comma, slash, a slash. What do you mean by coding? What's going through your head? Give me a minute of what's going through your head on these, on these 72 hours. Yeah, so especially from my from my end, the type of programming I do, it's very much about the user experience. So I'll use the example of something that we recently launched that took a while to do. So we just recently launched a drug interactions checker inside of Pearls, um, and so 
this is actually where I'm very grateful to my, my new uh, team member, uh, David, who's a, another pharmacist and engineer. He is more of a like backend developer than I am, meaning he took the database from the company we licensed from, opened it up, wired it up, and started feeding and creating feeds where interactions can come from. And then on my end, what I do is I design the interface that the user, that, that the actual user um, does to like work the drug interactions checker. So yeah, my personal process, and that's actually going back to the, orig- the start of this conversation, you asked what I'd compare it to. From my end, I kind of feel like a sculptor or like a woodworker. Like I'm very much like, hmm, what, what do we want this chair to look like? And then, and then, and then you work backwards from, oh, okay, well, how do I, okay, like I, 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 I picture the experience and then it's like, okay, now how do we reverse engineer the code that needs to be written for that? When you're coding, are you putting in dashes and hashes and blips and bleeps and that, or are you saying, I want this column to be center justified instead of left or right justified? You know, which of those two is it closer to? Yeah, uh, the uh, the former. Yep. So, the former. but 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 yeah. So it's, no, it's like what dashes and bleeps make it center justified or right justified. <laughs> you could reinvent the whole wheel on this, but typically what you're doing is you're you've got some like base things and you're telling those what to do. So the coding is telling you where to put a column. You're not inventing the column every time. You're telling the, another program where to put something that's kind of made already. Yeah, exactly. And actually, a, a lot of programming is copy and pasting like code like uh, from elsewhere. So just like actually, just like pharmacists like or will use whatever pearls, right, to look up. Like you're like, pharmacists will be like, I want to counsel a patient on this drug. Like I know what I want to do and I know where to get the information. So, okay, I'm going to, for that, I'm going to go to pearls and look up the, look up that. So yeah, literally on my end, I'll be like, Okay, I'm trying to move this button to the left. So let me just, if I don't remember it offhand, I'll just Google quick, like, um, what's the CSS code to center this, 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 this photo? Okay, great. Oh, there it is. Yep. Okay. Got it. Click, 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 click. So yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of a, yeah, it's, it's just, it's almost like pharmacy in that way or like, or like any domain. <laughs> Cause some of that coding that's out there, I mean, these are the horror stories of having like a million lines of code and you've done something wrong in line 328 and it affects something in line 500,000 or something like that. I mean, those that stuff's out there, right? 10 years ago, I would not have been able to start this business. Software development moves as fast as oncology pharmacy. <laughs> um, you know, it, it software development moves so fast. So actually, even 10 years ago, if you were to want to make a company like mine, I would have had to basically know three separate skill sets, one to do the website, one to do the iOS app, and one to do the Android app. And then further, or even take it back another 10 years, I would have had to buy like a server tower from Dell, bring it into my house. And so nowadays, it's so seamless to build simple or to build like, I guess, like just general products. So with with it's just a relatively recent development that with one programming language, JavaScript, for example, I can actually write um, Android apps, iOS apps, and websites, and server code all have the same thing. And further, I'm sure everyone's heard of like the cloud, like AW, Amazon Web Services, or Google Cloud Platform. So we use Google Cloud Platform, and that's where, like, Pearls is hosted on Google Cloud Platform. So I don't need to have a, to- again, a tower running out of my, my apartment here for the website to run. And so, yeah, this would this would not be possible. Like, it would, it would not have been possible for me to start this by myself if it wasn't for modern programming technology. Technology always wants to get smaller and, you know, more streamlined and all that kind of stuff. But I think about a program like Pearls and I'm thinking, I don't really want it on a smaller phone. I want it on this size phone. The size of the phone already got as small as it needed to be for me. And now there's things out there like, I suppose, glasses and having this show up on the back of your hand because you've got some skin tattoo. Think about like 100 years from now. Where would Pearls be a hundred years from now? What is it going to show up on? Is it going to be in your glasses? Is it, going to, is it going to be connected to your vocal cords and, and you just open your mouth out and this information just comes out without you thinking about it? Take a hundred years out of your program. What does it look like? Yeah. So, you know, the best medical information reference, I think once you look something up, you never have to look it up again because maybe you remember it. <laughs> and so that's actually, yeah, let me just speak maybe more, a little more um, theoretical so I think an issue that, like fundamentally, when technology makes things better is when it re- when it is when it removes friction. So like one of the best examples of innovation I like to give is like when we when we decided in the mid 
20th century to put fluorine in water, or, yeah, fluorine and fluoride in water supplies. Now a whole bunch of people have better dental health just for drinking the same old water they're already drinking. They didn't have to do anything. Of all the things, I think Grand Rapids was the first city that added fluorinated water. I mean, that's amazing. And yeah, I, I love that. But that's something that you just tripped over. It had to happen then. Oftentimes, like you mentioned, yeah, like glasses and all this stuff. I think that's where we've learned actually maybe over the last decade, you know, as as digital things have become more prominent, it's been like, oh, why don't we make it? There was the whole, let's make an app for everything. And then like we learned that like you know, people would make apps for every single like habits or for healthcare. And actually the app introduced friction. It was another step to open up the app and have to record something, you know, or to, or to open up the app to have to do something. And so that's where, yeah, I do think, you know, if I think from first principles, like what you were saying there, it's like, okay, what is Pearl is trying to accomplish? Well, we're trying to make whatever the most contemporary piece of clinical knowledge that there is about any subject usable for a clinician right when they need it, you know, without introducing friction. But I, I certainly can't describe for you what that looks like. And I can think of lots, you know, it's going to be, it's, it's going to be, that's the art of entrepreneurship, I guess. And so, yeah, we'll see. I was talking to someone, I think they gave the example of Elon Musk, but I'm going to kind of quote him. I don't know if it was he or not, but something like if the consumer of the self-driving car, if they have to put any input into it, that's too much or that's friction, something like that. He was saying like, you shouldn't have to put your car into reverse when you're next to a curb you know, looking backward, I forget what it was, but it was like any input that's needed is like user error. Now, I know it's not like to that degree, but it's like, it's an example of zero friction if you can. Yeah, no, that's where you think of things like, you know, welcome well, segues didn't work the first time, but now, you know, you have Lime and Bird working and it's just something about the way that because of new modern mobile technology, it's actually, you know, it's, there's a lot lower friction to like using one of those devices. And so that's where, yeah, timing is certainly very important. And so there may have been like, you know, you, you mentioned like, oh, glasses or some of these other things, which, you know, I, I agree. I'm like, oh, it's, yeah, that some of these things didn't really work. But it, like, it'll be curious to see what sorts of technology changes can, you know, if, if they if they make the timing for certain ideas to be better, because they do because whatever the fundamental friction point that that made an idea kind of not work, it, it could be different in the future. What was your reference there on the Segway? What were the two things that came out of that? So, um, you know, Segways just really didn't seem to work, but they're, they're not too much different than like the bird scooters, you know, like how people can rent those scooters to, to drive around. Like, it's like, well, how, how come Segways couldn't have, couldn't have done, I, I get, again, I've seen people like owns or I was maybe too young to remember all the Segway stuff, but like, you know, it's not much different in concept. And so just the fact that like wireless technology works fast enough to allow renting a scooter to, to start driving it and to stop driving it, it um, simple enough uh, that, it, that it made it a, you know, a value add to, to people's transportation. I never thought about that. Are those scooters, they don't use the, and I know you weren't implying this necessarily, but they don't necessarily use the Segway like spinning thing inside Not those of those, machines, do they? No, they, no. Those don't. Those mm -hmm. don't. Yeah, they're sort of just like electric scooters. You know what they're good for? They're good for putting drunks on them at night and they don't have a rear light on them and getting their legs tangled up and <laughs> cracking their femur. We had a customer or two come in, you know, saying that it's like, those things don't mix very well. No. I think I know a couple people personally that have wrecked from their face down to their broken legs on those things. I don't think those are going to be around a whole lot longer. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I, I would say, I feel like I've heard about them certainly less, especially since COVID when people are doing less traveling. And so, yeah, we'll see what the, if they, um, you know, what things look like. And they're all parked all over the place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And certainly people don't treat them like they're their own. And so, yeah. <laughs> no, that's right. Because I've walked up to some of them and, you know, they're all like, things always look better from a distance. Like when I, well, what do they say? The grass is always greener. You know, I come up to my house and I got a broken doorbell and, you know, the porch I know needs painting and things like that. But seems like every other house in the area looks perfect. Well, they got the same problems if you go up. But anyways, you go up to these Segway things and they're all they're all dinged up and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah. I've seen a couple in the Mississippi River here uh, in, in downtown Minneapolis. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. They're always parked in weird spots like these bikes are just all over the place and that. <laughs> yeah. Derek, I know that you've come from some other software ideas. 
What other holes do you see in the market if it wasn't pearls? The original thing I was um, wanting to do after graduation was actually start one of these digital pharmacies that you see. Like I, I actually, when I was a first year, at first, sec, first in my third year in pharmacy school, I took part in the NCPA business plan competition. And um, I, it's still my dream to apply technology properly to some sort of healthcare services delivery. And so I think all the efforts that have been made thus far are super valiant, you know, like I, I admire all the entrepreneurs who've undertaken and, and, you know, and all, you know, all of it, but, but obviously, you know, like, especially like, let's take digital pharmacies, for example, there hasn't really been a way to make it profitable. Are you talking like the hymns and those kind of things that focused on one product kind of pharmacies? Well, I actually think, yeah, those ones that are focused on one specific therapeutic area stack, I think they potentially seem to be doing at least better margins potentially than like full service pharmacies. Um, but yeah, just, it is certainly, I explored a business plan after graduation, you know, like, like many of, um, of, of, is there any way we, you know, cause if I had another life, I'm very jealous of, you know, independent, like in, independent pharmacy, you, you, you've had Kyle McCormick on in the past, who's a, a friend of mine who I love living vicarious. I think we kind of live vicariously through each other's businesses. I started this today by saying I was jealous of the coders and here you are saying you'd rather be in the independent shoes. So that's funny. Yeah, no, well, in, in some ways I view myself as a 20 as a 21st century independent pharmacist you know not that we you know you're just a you know i'm a pharmacist who's building his own business right isn't that isn't that what independent you know isn't that what independent pharmacy <laughs> um yes exactly yeah so i would certainly love to you know see if technology can find ways to build you know um i guess supplement create create margins for our profession and things that add value to patients so it's you know it's unfortunate that we're in a in a, in a day and age now where you know the the Based on just all of the pharmacoeconomic uh, forces, you know the product margins are are what they are, and so then they take away from the ability of pharmacists to perform their incredibly valuable services to patients. And so that, that's certainly a space that I, you know, someday hope to s spend more time uh, working in. So you're actually the independent pharmacist of the future because. If you were to open up an independent pharmacy now, they'd say, well, what is it going to be? And they'd say, well, you know, you listen to all the associations. It's no longer focused on product. It's on information, you know. And so independent pharmacists say, all right, well, what am I going to just do? Sit here and twirl my thumbs? You know, I don't have any product. How am I going to make money on that, you know? And so you come in as this independent pharmacist idea from the future, and you've made a profit or are making a profit on information on medicine without actual product. So you're there. You're the independent pharmacist of the future. I you know, I, I really, I resonate with that with in, a, in another way. I'll, yeah, I definitely think, yeah, we, we hear about in our profession, we need to find more ways for pharmacists to get paid for their cognitive abilities, right? And yeah. so, yeah, I would definitely view the ability for me to start this business in the very beginning was purely based upon my combination of my technical skills with my cognitive abilities of a pharmacist. I, I like to joke, I'm a 5 out of 10 pharmacist and a 5 out of 10 engineer. But a 10 out of 10 engineer with no pharmacy domain expertise could not have built pearls, and a 10 out of 10 pharmacist with no technical expertise could not have built pearls. Take a look at another, or several of the guests you've had on, like, like Tim Albrecht's another friend and mentor of mine. He's built a business that's differentiated itself because of his pharmacy domain knowledge, right? He's because of his understanding the pharmacist, he's built a financial services business. And there's so many others that I view would also view as are using their cognitive abilities to differentiate their, their business. I haven't monetized this podcast as of yet. And someday I may, I may. Oh, this podcast is a hundred percent example of that. Well, yeah. And someday I may monetize. Thank you. And I may monetize on a individual things with advertisement or else I always say it monetizes me because if something doesn't happen at the pharmacy, well, I can call up the 150 guests I've had and say, hey, I'm on the street now, you know, but <laughs> I've had a friend say, well, you should broaden it. Don't do pharmacy. It's like, what? So do a general show and take on Joe Rogan? No. Do a, a more focused show on marketing and take on, you know, Gary V? No, but I can do the business pharmacy podcast much better than Rogan, much better than Gary Vee. They don't know the area. And so if you niche down enough, not too small, but niche down enough, you're gold. No, it's 100% true. And this is this is something they actually teach us again at Y Combinator. Or you'll read this. This is really important in starting a business. It's in the early days, especially in the early days, but you can build your whole business on this. It's much more important. It's 
infinitely more important to have 10 people love you than have a thousand people like you. Because once you start with the 10 people who love you, then you grow your product by supplementing it to make the 11th person love you and the 12th person love you. But if you start by having a thousand people who like you, then nobody likes you. Then you're exactly, then you're not as good as any of those areas. And so the, the other, the other joke as well, but just make sure you don't become a trombone oil salesman because that, that, like that market is too small. Um, <laughs> um, and so I, I very much resonate with, yeah, you, you do things that, you know, do, start with an unscalable, potentially unscalable idea as long as it's making some number of small number of people 10 out of 10 love you and, and then build from there. Seth Godin, do you know Seth Godin? Yeah. Seth Godin says, build your business on the smallest viable population. So just what we're talking there. It has to be big enough because you can't sell the oil to the trombone people. It has to be big enough. But as soon as you find a viable option, define it however you want to define viable, whether you get your kicks out of it or whether it's something in the future, whether it is a current monetization. But once you find that smallest population, don't go any bigger than that because that's where those lovers of you are. And that's actually, I'll take it back to what we mentioned about like future pharmacy ideas that you met when you asked me, that's actually what I kind of like about like the hymns and the hers and the nurses is, is they're trying to make a 10 out of 10 experience for one therapeutic area. And then they can expand to replicate that experience for others. And that's why I think that, that's a fundamentally like a better place to start than making like an all purposes. Okay. Experience. These companies that start to lose their focus. I listened to one the other day, like I think it was dollar shave club, you know, no, 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 no. It wasn't dollar shave club. It was manscape these razors for your body and the ad i heard was manscapes you know lotions you know shampoos you know for area above your belt line you know something like this they start to expand they use their name they expand and it sounds good until somebody comes in and really narrows down that market again. Bundling and unbundling, bundling and unbundling. That's the that's the eternal cycle of right. Netflix put everything in one place, and now there's HBO and Disney Plus, and it's bundle unbundle. It's the it's the ever ending cycle. <laughs> bundling and unbundling. That's right. It's never ending. It focuses down, then it expands, and then someone comes in and out focuses them again. It's it's the never ending cycle. <laughs> There's a million examples of that. It's fascinating. Then you can't stop seeing it everywhere too, right? <laughs> right, right. I mean, like your thing, you know, you could have pearls. Mm -hmm. That could be going well. And pretty soon, you know, you have a thousand drugs and then somebody comes in and finds a way to just focus on like bio drugs. And you're like, oh, yep. Well, that must be how the world, like that's kind of how things move forward too, is it's like the, the, the new bundle comes in and makes things better than the previously unbundled solution. And then somebody unbundles one part of it in a better way. And then, and then someone comes back and rebundles this new, better unbundled to a bundle. And so, yeah, I hundred actually one of my big like existential risks to our business is, you know, one thing we're doing really well is connecting with like the next generation of clinicians. Like we have a like Instagram account with like 13,000 followers and then the next medical reference of all, like, you know, the names, you know, you know, the direct reference names, the next, the next company with the biggest Instagram following has 500 followers and they have, you know, they have no presence. I'm just waiting for the next social media platform to come out where somebody undercuts, you know, and so, I mean, that's, 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 but that's life. <laughs> if right now someone said to you, no more pharmacy stuff, no pearls, no other medical app kind of thing what would be another area that you would get into if they said no more medical stuff yeah i think a, a guilty pleasure of mine personally is like sports if i couldn't do this anymore i think i would maybe i think i would try and go be like a youth football sports coach so i, I got to do a little bit of that when i was in undergrad and yeah i really miss one thing i miss about sports and again this is no i'm not making any kind of political statement here but one thing we're missing in society is like leadership and that's where like in sports, I just, there's so much good feels in, um, and, and, and yeah, please do not take my statement there for being political. I'm talking about society, just with, especially what we talked about earlier, like all of the ways that pop, that, that, that culture tries to pull our attention in so many directions and, and, um, and, and almost like unbundle the individual. <laughs> um, I, I really would love to get back into like, and be in an environment around like, honestly, like just where there's teams and where there's coaching, where there's sports. And like I mentioned, I still love like, 
you know, being by myself and, and doing, you know, and, and being an introvert, but that's something I do miss. And I, I think I would, uh, would go into that realm. There's a psychiatrist I listen to online quite a bit. And, um, he talks about something that's missing in today's society and maybe parents aren't teaching their kids is that idea of play. And so he uses the example if he says, if you put two rats into a cage and one rat is certainly the dominant rat, let's say it's 50% bigger and rougher. He said that if you put them both into a environment, three out of 10 times that strong rat lets the lesser rat win in a play fight kind of thing. Because if the bigger rat doesn't allow the younger rat to win once in a while, the younger rat doesn't want to play anymore. Mm. Game over. They take their ball and go home. He was saying that competition, the reason for competition is not really to find, especially in games, it's not to find the winner and the loser. It's to, it's the old phrase. It's not who wins or loses. It's how you play the game. That's true. Because if you don't win and lose correctly, if you don't reciprocate somehow, either through, you might win, but at least you're showing respect, that kind of thing. If you don't reciprocate somehow, the game's over, you know, and we're seeing so much of that now, I think in society, the game's over, you know, cancel culture, all that kind of stuff. I haven't thought about it that way. And that, that, that resonates with me for sure. What's a cool week look like for you 10 years from now? What company are you running? What are you doing? How many hours a week are you working? That kind of thing. You're asking me this at a at a funny time in life. So I can remember, like even right now, like I mentioned, I'm you know I'm in the middle of this this Y Combinator accelerator, which is one of the top. You know what would have been one of my dreams, and I joked with some friends the other day. You know they were, you know, saying things, and I, man, my 24 year old self would have been so excited about this. But now as a you know rough rough you know 28 year old, you know I'm 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 starting to appreciate other things more, like. I heard someone say on a podcast, like it was a, it was actually a sports podcast. So the one guy, he lives in California and his dad lives in Boston and his dad came to visit him and his friend joked, oh, that was probably like the 40th time you're going to see your dad again before he dies. I saw that. It was a Bill Simmons podcast. It's like the dad, he's going to die in seven years and you see him three times a year. You're going to see him 21 more times kind of thing. Something like that. Yes, exactly. And so for me, that's been a huge focus lately too. So that's how I kind of am keeping myself, I feel like balance of not getting too swept up in this business stuff is like trying to really, again, that regret minimization frame, we're trying to really keep close. Like how many more times can I see my parents? You know, they live a couple hours away. My, my wife's family lives more than that, you know, a couple States away. How many times can we see, make sure we see them, you know, and, and just have those moments. And so, yeah, so t 10 years from now, that might be too far for me to think ahead. Um, and, and I, and I feel good about the fact that I, I just hope 10 years from now, I won't be regretting the balance of, of, of those important moments. If you went in right now to a graduating class of pharmacy students, what would your life spiel be to them? Assuming that you like the road you took to this point, and you talked about it earlier about taking the chances now and so on, what would you tell a class of graduating pharmacy students? I, I would say I have some opinions here. Um, and so I, and I'll preface it by saying, I'm still very bullish on pharmacy, um, despite what you hear. And, and it's because of maybe the path I've taken. So healthcare is, I think, uniquely an area that has yet to be, you know, uh, or has so much potential, you know, innovations in it. But it's not a low-hanging fruit sector because there's so much domain expertise required to apply technical solutions to, to problems. And so... One thing I wish would happen, actually, is I wish all pharmacy schools could make their program last three years instead of, you know, there's a few that do it now. Cut one of the didactic years. Get, you know, get, get we need more rotations um, and, and make them three years long because the, the four years is really killer, actually, to like someone who's applying to pharmacy school. For sure. I think it's very, I think it'd be a very smart career path to say, I want to go to pharmacy school to get clinical domain expertise and then take it to technology. But four years is just too long and there's too much of an opportunity cost where if it was three years, because uniquely I've noticed pharmacists have a really unique clinical skill set. So doctors, say you go to a medicine program, you get very siloed into one area, even though you are the, you know, the boss <laughs> in healthcare, you know, they're the big fish, you know, MDs, 
but they're very siloed in healthcare where pharmacists, because basically you're kind of a de facto chronic diseases specialist, which is what 80% of patients actually deal with. That was one thing I was most shocked by on when I was on fourth year rotations and I was in, on my acute care rotation. I remember saying to my preceptor, is it just the same 30 people who come in and out of here every week? <laughs> like it's such, you know, but in other professions, like I would say even like physician associate or assistants and nurse practitioners, they also kind of get siloed, even though they're pretty high level, you know, pretty deep domain experts, they get kind of siloed. Uh, and then there's other professions that I would say don't quite have the extent of domain knowledge that pharmacists do. Like a PharmD in some ways is almost like being a healthcare domain expert generalist, which then you can come into lots of other like non-traditional type of roles and that are like like in, in technology companies or or in, at a legal practice or at a financial practice and really bring the and really have an understanding of how healthcare is delivered. Um, where again, some other professions I would say don't quite have a high enough degree of education or patient, you know, ought to, patient, you know, decision making. And, and some other professions are almost too siloed. Like many doctors don't understand, you know, so many things about how they, they, they understand the medicine super well, but not how like care gets in the hands of patients, aka insurance and all these other things. So I think that is, that would be my, you know, speech to, to students would be you, ha you are a healthcare domain expert just because the job market for traditional pharmacy roles may seem a certain way, don't undervalue the domain expertise you have. And I hope that more linear paths to roles where healthcare domain expertise can be applied happen. Like, for example, when I was a first year in pharmacy school in 2014, between when I graduated in 2018, the number of industry fellowships almost 10x. And so, you know, in, like to go to go into the pharmaceutical industry as a medical science liaison or a regulatory affairs specialist. And so I'd love to see that, like, like my company, for example, we're going to be launching a, a drug information fellowship or slash, you know, digital health. And I think there's other like companies where we need to, you know, create more other pharmacists who are doing non-traditional roles. See if you can find a way to create a linear path to that role. Um, and because I think fellowships too nicely bridge the like compensation issue because like an entry level data analyst doesn't make as much money as an entry level pharmacist makes, but an entry, but that, that pharmacist isn't really going to be good enough at data analytics to be better than the data analyst in like a healthcare role. But after a year of fellowship, I think you could justify paying uh, after a year, of after a year of fellowship and after you, you're certain that these, that, that the, the, the applicant has successfully melded their healthcare domain expertise with the industry they're trying to apply it to, then I think they actually, there's, there's, there's no longer actually a ceiling on what they, what they could be worth in some of these other industries. You know, there's product managers and, and engineer managers at, at Amazon that make, you know, $700,000 a year, you know, and so we can, we can get people with PharmDs into roles that no longer have, um, limitations to where, how they're applying their, their knowledge. Let's say you're going in as a, as a graduating class. You're not trying to sell them on pharmacy anymore. They've already chosen pharmacy, but mm -hmm. everybody can use a pep talk, especially when you're $170,000 in debt and you've <laughs> just spent seven, eight years in school. Everybody can use a pep talk on why their degree is a hot degree. I, I, this is, that's what I would tell them for sure. And I think, and I hope that again, especially, and this would especially help if we could make pharmacy school three years. I think it's, you know, if, if we can, like, people would be wanting to go to PharmD for this reason. Derek, I had Tim Albrecht on the show, and I started off saying my dad, pharmacy was a four-year degree. Great degree to have to then either, at the time, you maybe didn't have MBAs, but great degree to go into med school or a dentist or, you know, whatever you wanted to do it further on than just your bachelor's degree. But I told Tim, as far as I know, I ain't no world traveler, but as far as I know, over in Europe, they don't repeat the first two years of college with redoing your junior and senior year of high school. So in my opinion, you get rid of the freshman, sophomore year of college, you know, all that English over again and psychology and biology, all that stuff you already learned in high school. So you get rid of that and then you make pharmacy, especially community pharmacy, make it like a two or three year program. And then maybe farm D or clinical or something, maybe you go an extra year or something, but Turn the whole damn thing into three years versus seven years, and then watch what the entrepreneurs can do when they're twenty thousand in debt instead of a hundred and seventy thousand in debt, and maybe they're five years younger. Where I thought you were going with that is the first year of pharmacy school is like redoing the last year of your biochemistry degree, you know, for for a lot of people. And so I think as, as soon as possible, pharmacy schools need to get 
pharmacist students in front of patients. You learn everything on appies. <laughs> Let's cut to the chase. When you're on your fourth year is when you really learn a whole bunch of stuff. And not, you know, the other years are certainly important to get you safe and prepared for that. And I realize it's a, it's a logistical nightmare to coordinate these practice experiences for pharmacy school. So I understand that's a challenge. But what you go to pharmacy school for is, is the patient care. That, that's what's actually, whether you don't want to do that or not, what I learned on my appies is what is, makes me different than somebody who's a programmer. Appies is your last year of school with your different internships and that, right? Yeah, that fourth year, right. You take the idea of skipping the last two years of high school. So you wipe out the first and second year of college. And you're saying the first year of pharmacy school is also a repeat. Are we down now to one year of classes and one year of internships? Is it a two-year program? Sure. And I, I do think more practice, the practice experiences cannot be cut. So, you know, the physician assistant or associates, um, you know, I know they're, they're transitioning the name. They do two years year round, right? Um, and so I think, yeah, you can make it a, make PharmD a three year or two year year round program. And, and no matter what, yeah, we just, you need to like, you need to cover the in more patient care, more patient care, because that's where the, that's the differentiating skill sets. That's where your program comes in because the knowledge, you've got the knowledge at your fingertips of the charts and the drugs and the names and, and all that kind of stuff. It's learning how to pull that knowledge out with patients over that two year period. Yeah. In my, you know, kind of in my non traditional role now, the advice I would give my yeah, kicking and screaming third year pharmacy student self would be hey, man, you might want to think about doing a three month community pharmacy residency like that. Cause like e even though like I was, always kind of, or towards the end of my pharmacy school, I was angling to do non-traditional careers. The patient care knowledge is actually what differentiates me in this non-traditional role. And so, you know, if I, if I could insert something into my life, it would have been like, if I could have fit like an ambulatory care residency into, into my life somewhere between graduating and, and what I'm doing now, I'd, I'd have, you know, the clinical knowledge would be what's unique about what I'm applying, you know, what we're applying to software with, you know, with Pearls. You can take a hundred people that came from different directions. Some learned biology, some in a physician assistant, some that went to med school and maybe didn't finish through and, and then take business people and take programmers and all that. You can throw a hundred people in there. And really one of the differential things is that pharmacists, not exclusively, but pharmacists are the ones that have spent time on this broad spectrum with patients. Exactly. And making decisions, you know, so yeah. So I think yeah, the core part of pharmacy school is learning pharmacotherapy. So you maybe need to learn that in class. And then as soon as you do that, then you, then you need to go, go see patients and apply the pharmacotherapy. Well, Derek, we solved the world's problems today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm glad. That let this, let this uh, set the record straight. <laughs> Congratulations of where you've come from so far, and it's going to be fun seeing where you're going. Yeah. No, thanks so much, Mike, for letting me come on here and give me a platform. And I'm, I really appreciate it. And and everything else that this show is, is bringing, you know, it's bringing so much value. Thank you for this opportunity. Thanks so much, Mike. Thank you, Derek.